<clears throat> hey, what's up, you guys? How's it going? This is a quick uh, pop-up stream, as always. We've done in the past, uh, just to hang out for a little bit and to sketch, to draw, talk about a few things. Uh, as we're ramping up for our um, nice holiday break, I figured this would be a good one to do, so before I travel a little bit here. Um, in any case, uh, welcome for those of you that are here for the first time, and also those of you coming back many often, uh, situations like this, uh, where I do a little bit of a pop-up like that on my Instagram, and uh, just kind of talk about when I'm going to be jumping in. It's never really scheduled, that's why I call it a pop-up. Uh, it's just really one of those cases where I have a moment in time, and I should be packing tonight, but... Uh, it's okay, because I'm traveling home uh, tomorrow back into Portland, Oregon. So before I do so, I figure I'd just hang out for a little bit at least and sketch some things in my book. So um, <clears throat> I'm actually brewing something right now. I forgot to actually grab it. So uh, I think I'll leave it out for the moment. Uh, I was drinking some also milk teas earlier, so I might have to ease down on that for tonight. But um, we will be opening up some cards. I have some special things over here for myself just for the sake of the hobby. And then, of course, um, I'll be sketching for you guys a little bit today as well, too. So uh, I'll be using this accordion book, as we've always done in the past. And I'll just kind of keep check of the zoom in case it's a bit too far off. I'll zoom a bit closer for you guys. This one's almost done. So I have pretty much have filled this one up on one side, which some of you in the past in live streams have seen these filled up. And then, of course, on the other side, I got started. And uh, these were also done on situations of live streams. And uh, I kind of transitioned into one of the last bits of pages over here. And so once this part gets done, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. And this is the last section, literally, right here. So this is section I'm going to actually focus in on today. Uh, see if I can actually finish it up for you guys. So that way this book will be complete for the year. So in the year, I filled up two of these. And on top of that, of course, about three other sketchbooks. <laughs> so in a year, I'm filling up about five, six on average, typically. Uh, and of course, you know, back in the day when I was teaching in person many times, I would be filling up upwards of a, of a you know, dozen sketchbooks at a time. So uh, we will get to this in just a moment. Um, while we're here, you guys can definitely ask questions, talk about things as much as you want to. I'm going to actually zoom in a little bit more just so we can have better framing of this. Sorry for the jumping in and out. We'll stay right about there. Hopefully the camera doesn't shake too much if I'm moving the table. No, it's fine. Uh, tools today that I'll be drawing and sketching with will be the um, Magic Pen. I don't know exactly what brand this really is. Uh, and then, of course, I have the Tombow uh, Furinosuke pens. So these ones I'll be using primarily. And I don't expect a lot of people to jump in today. Uh, this is just a moment for us just to hang out for a little bit. So for those of you that are, that are sticking around, my suggestion is to you, for you guys to just sketch with me. Uh, we don't have a necessarily subject just yet, so I figure you guys can kind of warm up. And if you're not really doing anything to, uh, much tonight, you could be listening in, but you can also be sketching with me. Um, any questions are allowed. Typical questions are regarding things of your own personal interest within the curiosity of education, industry, portfolios, art talks, materials, anything you want to discuss within those regions of the umbrella of, of topic, we can definitely get into. Of course, offhand questions of you know entertainment stuff, things like films and comics and collectibles, things that I also like to very much get into and use this kind of live stream for, uh, we can also use to be able to converse and talk with each other on. So jump in anytime you guys want to. I actually bought this pack recently. It's a bit of an expensive one, but I've always wanted to kind of bite the bullet and go for one that's a bit more higher end. Uh, most of the cards I tend to kind of open up are more retail, so I don't have to spend way too much money. But I figure for the end of the year, just for the gift to myself, <laughs> I figure I get something a bit more high end. Uh, so this one will have a lot of autographs inside of them. Uh, so a potential of getting some interesting and unique cards. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so, you know, other than that, going on break tomorrow, uh, during the time when I'm on break, while I'll be uh, visiting family and such up in Portland, uh, I might actually jump on for some live streams also uh, on my phone. So I'll have my materials, i have my phone, I'll have a little stand. So if I have a chance in a moment, we're not really doing anything because the weather will go sour up there. It's going to be pretty cold. So being inside most of the time, potentially, I might actually jump in once or twice. Uh, just so we can kind of do these kinds of live streams more uh, currently as we go through because I haven't been on probably about a week or two, uh, maybe if not longer. It feels a bit long because I used to be on like twice a week actually. Um, I'm going to break out these packs. There's only four of them in here, so it's not going to be a very long opening because uh, there, aren't, there aren't that many packs within. This is a Spectra collection which has potentials of four autographs uh, and there's only four cards per pack. 
and they're four packs per box. And this is for the 21, 22 year of, and I, I like, you know, basketball, NBA, football kind of stuff. So um, I only have four packs within. And um, let's see, I don't think I need anything else. If there's anything I have to sleeve up, I might do it afterwards, uh, and not during the camera time. So once we finish up here, we'll just jump into our sketchbook and sketch up a little bit here. And of course, continue talking. Um, if I don't open these easily, I'm trying to be careful with them. I don't want to see exactly what they are just yet because I want this to be a bit of a surprise for myself as well. Uh, there are a couple of base cards in here, then several um, autographs and memorabilia stuff. Let's go from the back first. Uh, and anything numbered, I'm going to put aside. Anything, um, you know, kind of special, I want to keep. So certain rookie cards like this guy right here, Josh Giddy, has been doing pretty good so far. And uh, we have a 7 of 10. Uh, Austin Reeves, and this is a rookie card of guy at Lakers. He's doing pretty good right now too. So out of ten, uh, this is number seven. So they number these cards out. So there's a limited run of how many they print. So this is also um, a nice piece right there. And so these are really thick cards. And so these I will put aside for the moment. Base cards like this, I'll just keep. A lot of this stuff I tend to hold on to just for the part of the collection. I like collectibles and stuff. I've been collecting cards since I was a kid. Uh, a lot of times, you know, Marvel cards, comic cards as well. But I used to collect a lot of sports cards also. Uh, one of my favorites was um, actually Nolan Ryan has a picture. And they used to release this uh, baseball card set in packs of only Nolan Ryan. And I used to buy a lot of this stuff when I was just a kid. Going to like a local convenience store. And I would just buy them off the pack. Uh, the Marvel card stuff I used to buy because my grandmother would get them for me. So I would walk with her to the grocery store to get groceries, you know, maybe like once every two weeks. So I'd run you know, over to the aisles of where the cards were, and I would grab like three or four packs. And, um, you know, this is like before the age of like 10. Uh, so I used to buy those and open them up and, you know, create the, um, you know, the whole binder collection that some of you guys I'm sure may have even done. Uh, this is Greg Brown. Third, this is 48 out of nine, 49, numbered card. Don't remember if that giddy was numbered. Base shade. This guy just beat us, Portland. I <laughs> think the game was last night or today. This guy went off. Another rookie card, and another autograph. Probably three out of seventy-five. Maybe a patch. Cameron Thomas. And this is a way for me to just kind of like let off steam, uh, just to you know have interest in things. I have another Rick Brown that's still here again. A repeat card. This one's not numbered though. Hmm. Brogdon, here's that same card. Base, another base. Garnett, interesting. Court side. This is, um, okay, it's interesting. This is one of the first times I've ever gotten a card like this before. Uh, this is basically a redemption card. So you put in an order for this on their website and they will send you the card. I don't know who it is, but who it's supposed to be is it's a rookie, uh, James Booknight, autographed. That's pretty cool. This is the first time I'm getting this. So it's nice to have a rookie and Booknight is a, is a solid player. So that's a nice one to keep. This one is solid and last pack. Hopefully you get something, but uh, we'll see what it is. Might be just memorabilia. I think it should be another autograph. There's Jeremy Grant. He's on Portland right now. Base. Uh, sharp. Number card. And the last autograph. Spencer Lee. All right. Not too bad. Uh, this one, the rookie card. Definitely a nice hit. This one also, too, the redemption will be also a nice one. Uh, so these two cards I definitely will sieve up in cases. These ones are just going to be for um, just collection. I might sell them off. We'll see where it goes. Expensive box, but also fun to open up. Let's put these aside for the moment. These two, this one. Make sure to keep nice and pristine. And the Austin Reeves. 
out of 10. It's pretty good. All right. So <clears throat> that was just for me to kind of like, you know, get into some breaking again. Uh, been super into card collecting recently. The bug has bit, so I'm kind of still in that mindset of just wanting to have those kind of collectibles. Um, this particular stream, we're going to keep, you know, straightforward, uh, not brief. We'll keep it maybe under an hour if we can. Uh, like I said, I'm going to jump into this uh, accordion book that I have. And if the lighting is a bit dark, what I might try to do here is adjust it. I'll do that instead. Hopefully that makes it a bit brighter and better. So uh, we do have the back end of this book that we're starting into. And um, we just kind of go through it real fast. But just so you guys see, these are the other two accordion books that I have. So I have three total of these particular books. This one, I don't remember where I got it from, honestly. It's a Godzilla, um, you know, accordion book that I, this is the first one accordion book I ever got. And uh, I don't remember exactly where I got it. Um, this was probably sometime last year, I think. Let me see the date. What year is this? I don't think I put a year on it. I should do that more. I gotta put years on these things. I wanna say I got this last year though, um, this particular book. And so this one was fun because it was my first time doing an accordion book. But uh, the paper is really interesting because uh, this is actually more like a rice paper. It's actually quite thin, but it's, it's double layered. So if you open it up and split it, it's double layered like this. It's really rough on one side and smooth on the other. It's really interesting. And there had um, paper like this in an accordion kind of sandwich. And it's also one long continuous piece of paper. Um, there's no actual binding in between, which is actually really nice in terms of construction. So I actually feel that the this accordion book that I found is a bit better in quality than the uh, one made by Etcher. So this is company Etcher right here, uh, accordion book. It's not bad also. This is an accordion book with watercolor paper. But the problem with the watercolor paper that they have here is that it only has a certain amount of length, it seems like. So it continues and continues and goes down and goes down. And at some point, uh, if you look at the back side of it, you'll find a, uh, a break right here. And so this is actually glued as a singular layer piece. So it's not bad. It's just that it's not also the most presentation wise the best. <laughs> Um, so it seems like in watercolor length, they, they only have a certain length it can go to until they have to actually add another piece to it. Construction is strong. Um, you know, it uses a, a fake leather kind of cover and it looks okay. I wish they had some variety of color sets and whatnot, or some, you know, different materials for the cover itself, but they only come in one type and the watercolor paper is good. This is a cold press paper, maybe about 300 pound, uh, GSM. So it's, it's nice, not 300 pound, 300 GSM paper. But this one actually, I really am fond of. I wish I could find more of these. And again, the problem is I don't know where I got it. <laughs> so I, I know I got it at some kind of Japanese uh, stationery store. I just don't know which one it was. I kind of want to think it was somewhere, not the one I go to the Japanese bookstore, the uh, Kino Kamiya. It's not that, but it was a different one. So and I don't know if I can find it. I, I can look on Google. I haven't Googled it actually. So maybe if somebody does find it online uh, in this current session, they can let me know. It's like, oh yeah, that's on you know this storefront. So you'll find the Godzilla uh, accordion book made by it looks like well this is obviously toho brand but there's no branding on it, anything else wise so anyways so once i got that one and finished it up and then jumped over to the accordion book from etcher because this was also just another find at the art store locally from here so i picked one up because um you know i liked that previous one and i couldn't find it again in the in store kind of purchase so i decided to go with this you know give it a try it's a little bit larger which was nice um, it's a bit more rigid being the watercolor paper, which I also thought would be good to have. Uh, so like I said, it worked out pretty well. So if I kind of spread it out again and kind of see more of the spreads within, uh, this is a accordion book for you, So you can start to see the spread of it goes wider and wider. And so, um, I don't tend to work on these like page to page. I kind of treat them more through spreads initially, like double page spread. And then sometimes I'll, I'll you know, flip it over and continue it or I'll extend it even further like this to get a four page spread. Uh, so as I do two over here, I then turn to this page, kind of get an initial starting, and then I fill the gaps in between as I do a full spread out like this. So that's typically how I use these accordion books. Um, you know, sometimes I'll draw with them at like cafes and, and stuff like that. A lot of times I'm also even sometimes drawing on location with this stuff. So the way I would hold it is like this. 
So I would actually uh, let it fold over in on itself like that. Oops, like this. And then I sandwich it and I hold it up like that and just draw a sketch. Um, then I'll flip back and forth from here. And I'll spread it out sometimes. But once I spread it out, I need to have some kind of backing. And that's the one unfortunate part for these kind of sketchbooks. So a lot of you guys have seen these particular pages beforehand. This is the back side again. So this would be the third one for the year to fill up. Just making sure you guys can see it. I didn't, I didn't post this one. That one I did a, a couple weeks ago. That one didn't post. Uh, this was my most recent addition to it, which is this uh, Tarada Dragon. So I saw Katsuya Tarada the other day and um, was sketching him out live while he was scratch uh, sketching as well too. And then he uh, added a little sketch of his own in there as I walked up to him. We we've chatted a handful of times. And uh, every time he comes into town, I always come saying hi to him and stuff like that. So, um, you know, he always does a quick sketch for me as he does with uh, all the other people getting booked and stuff like that. So I added this component right here uh, afterwards. So what I'm gonna do now is jump into the rest of the book. And I wanna start from here. I usually like to kind of Kind of press it down so it's a little bit more flat. And we're going to start from here and work my way around. So this is the very last page on this side. I'm going to spread out a little bit further so it lays down flat. Okay, I don't know exactly what I'm going to be sketching, so uh, we'll see where we go from this. Um, I might end up kind of like building off of the inspiration from this piece, which is some kind of like, you know, bird-like demon combination of mechanical things, which was inspired, of course, from Tarada's work, which at the same time also wouldn't be a bad idea to be using as internal inspiration to sketch and draw from. Um, let's see. The pen I'm going to be using right now is that magic pen. And this one's a little bit thinner, which is a felt tip pen, um, a bit more compressed, not like a really a brush pen or anything like that, but it's uh, you know, pretty much a fine point and it's starting to go down a little bit in terms of how much I've used it for and it's lasts pretty long so far. It doesn't hold a lot of ink, I'm assuming. Um, but yeah, it's held up so far okay. Uh, so usually in my mind, I'm kind of like playing with some ideas about what I could be sketching. It usually goes into the idea of topics, uh, subject matter based on animals or, or things that I've seen, uh, a lot of stuff that's, you know, kind of created and made up of mechanical things as well too. So my imagination starts to play with the idea of just kind of pulling from different things and mixing it kind of together. Um, the very last thing I drew, obviously, was this kind of dragon character. And um, the last things I actually even drew in class were some figurative-based things. And I actually did a thing with the arm wrestling stuff, which was fun. And we have some bots in here already. Let me boot him real fast. Or this person. <clears throat> okay, so let's get rid of this stuff. Yeah, and again, welcome for those of you that are joining for the first time. All right, cool. So uh, let's go into it then. Um, maybe I'll build off of this first, and then we'll turn into something more of like an elaborate piece on this side. So I kind of want to build off of uh, this particular head, doing more creature head-like things. And I don't know exactly what yet, but I like to always just kind of start with an eye. But I kind of want to maybe turn it. That'd be kind of cool. So in my mind, uh, what I just kind of imagined or saw, and it wasn't necessarily like a direct image or picture. It was more of an idea uh, where it came from. I have a position of the head over here, and I did something with the skulls uh, in this previous portion of the accordion book where it went through an evolution of a transition from a werewolf, from a human skull to like a, like a wolf skull. So that was like a transformation that kind of went into this one. This one, I don't want to do that. I kind of want to play with the idea of turning forms. So I'll play with something similar of a design or look to this kind of creature-esque like thing. But uh, I'm going to be turning the position of the head. And eventually it'll become more front and through quarter view, then side again. Uh, welcome again, Doe. Thank you for um, joining in. Lance Threader, appreciate that. Thank you. Question from um, here, another one is, what are my thoughts on, well, this is a question we get all the time, right? <laughs> now, every single stream, uh, people are going to be asking about this particular hot subject, as I'm sure is to be expected for any stream of person doing um, art stuff. 
about the notion of where things of future will go towards tech and art, uh, specifically in mind, of course, of the whole AI thing. I don't know if I'm going to spend an exorbitant amount of time discussing that because I don't feel like I really need to in the fact that most of you already know that I do mostly analog art. <laughs> so any digital art that I do is more client-based things but never, never really get posted that much anyways. Um, of course, I'm sure people are expecting me to be vocal and, and talk about, you know, for the sake of other artists and such. Um, I understand, but there's, you know, many, many people out there kind of already in that influencer side of mentality, which I get. And, and I know I understand that, you know, for many people, that's an important aspect of how to use social media. Uh, but I just want to draw, <laughs> you know, I just want to draw and create and post things. Um, unfortunately, I think what, what's happened with this recent advent is uh, not just in terms of the whole discussion of where things go and, and you know how things are running, but it's kind of taken the the energy away from people to create. It feels like a lot of the people that I follow, you know, a lot of the artists that I know, I mean, it's it's great for them to share their opinions and share their thoughts and concerns, but then they're not posting art anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, I know they don't want to because they're like, well, now they don't have anything on ArtStation, and then Art Instagrams maybe they were the only place they posted, but then they only post, and even if they did, they only post it like once in a while, and that's. It's weird because I've, I've been looking through, not really weird, it's, it's understandable, where I would even go through Instagram recently. Um, and I would do this once in a while. And I'm sure some of you guys will do this as well too. You'll go through your followers, right? Um, because it's, you know, due, due to the algorithm, sometimes you'll see for certain followers you like and certain people you don't see them in a while, right? And you go through your followers and you all of a sudden realize, oh, I follow that person. You click on their link and uh, you go to their profile thinking, what have I missed? But a lot of the times they haven't posted anything, you know? Um, so it's kind of, uh, it's one of those things where now I, I kind of wish I could see more work from people, especially ones that I really like, you know, getting inspiration from. And, um, you know, hopefully they'll get back into the swing of things, you know, once things feel more suitable in their environment to do so. And, uh, right now, you know, most people's thoughts and minds are within the focus of this discussion. Um, and, and, and I want them to have it. That's on them and, and they're going to do the thing they're going to do. But I hope to see more art, you know, into the future. Um, well, I mean, even, you know, my stuff, as analog as it is, it is digitized once I put it on social media. But, um, I mean, I don't even really think about that. But, you know, to say that I'm not thinking about it, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be thinking about others. Well, again, it's a situation where... Um, it is the current situation, of course, and, you know, does that mean I should just stop completely, 100%? Uh, I, I certainly don't want to, um, and I, I'm going to keep sharing it because that's my way of being able to connect to people, uh, and I see it more on that side, more of the idea of continue to really nourish the, the community that I want to, um, and have them continue to really develop and, and push their skills and, and build their creative edges, and, and also continue to really, you know, um, produce a very strong creative environment, if anything else. Uh, I kind of need that in terms of how I interact within my own field. Ever since I was very young, I've always had friends and people that were kind of like there as coworkers or team members or, you know, people that we tend to kind of draw a lot together with. And, um, you know, growing as an artist when I was a student, I, I can't do it by myself. We all need people to some degree. And, you know, this whole AI thing has kind of put a stunt in, in the creative push because people are very afraid to post things now because they don't want things stolen. Um, but the thing is like, it's kind of always been that way for a while. Uh, I understand this is a new format in terms of it literally being taking images from online data, but even as people are posting up things like selfies and photographs on Facebook, that data content is now there, you know, uh, it doesn't really ever go away. And again, at the same time, it doesn't mean that, you know, we should just let it slide. I'm not saying that at all either. Um, people should very much be aware of how they want to treat their future within art and technology uh, and if they feel very much it's a concern in their you know uh, ways of livelihood and how they interact with that medium then and they want to stop then that's on them uh, and I certainly support that but um, like I said for me this is also a livelihood because most of my work I do is through teaching and classes I have online so I need to be able to promote market share connect do stuff like this and if I don't then um, there's no work right uh, so, you know, what do you do in that situation? Well, do I just stop to make the case of, you know, AI art should be more aware of how they're affecting artists? It's, it's given. They should be. And it should be, you know, corrected in some ways in terms of really be more regulated, if anything else. But through that regulation, do we just stop and hold our breath and wait? Because 
there are many of us that we can't, you know. Now, there are other artists that are, you know, having this kind of say, but they're full-time artists and they work in studios or they have kind of regular full-time jobs. I don't have that. I'm an independent artist. So there are other independent artists that are like this too. And of course, again, they're afraid of having their work stolen. But if they don't stay active, then they get no work at all, you know. So um, they need to obviously engage in some way. Um, that's why I need to continue, you know, obviously. But uh, at the same time, you know, I'm not a user of those things. So I don't even know how to begin, <laughs> you know. Uh, people, you know, of course, there's a whole apps now and stuff like that. And I know TikTok has its own kind of like thing as well, too. But uh, it's not really even a scope of like consideration for me uh, in terms of engaging within it. But then also like even looking at it. Like anytime anybody posts on it, I'm like, I'm not even interested in looking at AI art. It's not creative to me. It's not, you know, anything of visual interest or uh, inspiration in a lot of ways. Now, I know a lot of people are saying that it could be used as a tool to help build inspiration. Sure. And if they do, great. And I have no uh, complaints if people turn to certain technologies. But again, it's what I've said in the past. It's all about the user responsibility. Educate yourself about what it does and how it's working. Um, and if you understand its tools and using it responsibly, then there could be potential benefits from it. Uh, as I said earlier, I think if there was the way in which how it would have it I guess, progress forward in terms of that technology. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily even let it uh, go out into the public, honestly. Uh, you know, who knows if you can even control that anymore because it's already out there. Well, I guess even if it is out there, in terms of it being used responsibly, in my opinion, from the professional standpoint, right? We can't say anything about the public because they're going to do what they're going to do. You can't stop that. But on the professional side, which can influence the public, is showing how we as professionals could use it as a tool, which could be in a studio environment. It's an encapsulated you know, data pool uh, from the artist creating content for, let's say, a product that they're making, a game, movie, whatever the case is. And they're looking for many different sort of options, iterations of design, right? If I got to design a character for an animation, the artist can create, obviously, their iterations through literally drawing and painting it digitally or analog. But then if you create all that digital work and analog work and scan it and put in digital files, uh, you create a pool of content, which in the AI art, AI art can go in there internally within that studio and generate many more iterations of possibilities, right? So it's only using then the data pool or, or the image pool within that studio. It's not allowed to go out into the you know internet and other public spaces and grab things outside that area. Uh, now we as artists can use you know sources of inspiration from things like reference images, outside information, or even things like artists artists that we look at as well too. So we're still bringing in a bit of that outside source information, but we're being kind of the filter, right? So as we filter that information, we put it into our own work, and we put it into that data pool, the AI art can then take advantage of that information based on what we create in that studio. So each team, each studio has its own AI-driven, almost like its own employee, right? A, a, a digital AI employee that goes in there and works with the team, basically. But that's within the, the you know, professional environment, in the public. You know, this is like a whole other thing. Um, you know, you can't control it anymore because like, like they said, the cat's out of the bag. And as Pandora box has been opened, you're not going to be able to get rid of it. Uh, so like I said, education is a key. If the public or the people who are looking at this stuff can be educated to find out how they could be used responsibly. And let's say, is it, is it someone in the public or a young person saying, well, I want to use AI art in some way. How can I do that? Well, let's say you and a team of people, let's say other students and your friends can, you know, generate a pool of visual work, sketches, drawings, digital, analog, and pull it together and say, let's try to find a way to create weird amalgamations of this stuff based on our work, not other people's work, right? Then maybe it can be centralized to help them create many different ideas. Again, I think, yeah, brainstorming, uh, design exploration. Exploration in general is a, is a proper way of generating AI art, not necessarily like printed stuff or finalized things to be sold to the public, more for the process of developing ideas. But it can't be used as an excuse by saying, we can use that just for finding inspiration. I don't need that to do it. I can do it myself, but we can still at least show a client many, many more options, you know, based on things that we can maybe have in a collection of work that we submit to, let's say, the people that have, you know, the money that run the project, um, because it can assist within our also efficiency and speed, you know. Um, but that's just one way of looking at it. But there's no way to regulate this. Um, and there's no way to control it because, again, the, the more troubling factor is that within people out there using this kind of technology, there are people that don't care. 
you know, uh, that regardless of any sort of like information about how this can be used professionally, because for them, it's about generating money, right? As people, you know, I saw this recent posting about, you know, the, the division of what some of the YouTube videos about how art is displayed. And from the AI art standpoint, it's all about like, here's how you can use AI art to make money, you know? Uh, sell this stuff, make this amount of money. And then also on the art side of YouTube, it's more about tutorials and you know methods of how you train and, and build a skill set. Because one takes a lot more skill, the other one is more about prompting words, right? Um, so it, it's not necessarily the problem of the technology, it's the problem of the people, what they're interested in, which is making income, <laughs> profit from the thing. So even if you're trying to resp be responsible and educate people, they don't care because there's going to be a, definitely a group of people that don't want to use it that way. Uh, they're going to take advantage of others, and that's the way life has always been, right? So, um, and because it's out there now, there's no way to regulate. Um, but at the same time, if for the younger people who are confused by this, because they are trying to do the responsible thing, um, by the people in the professional field setting up the standard of how they should engage in it, and the problem right now is it's being squashed as saying you shouldn't touch it at all, uh, and it shouldn't be something that you should even consider. And it should, it should only be something you, you build your skill set by drawing and painting uh, and, and completely demonize that thing. For the professionals that are already out there, I understand because they've already built their niche or their skill sets or their reputation or where they work. But for the younger person in high school, they listen to stuff like this. Again, it, it creates divisions, which is really hard then for people to come together and figure out what the next steps are. All it does is it create camps and arguments and also headbutting. So no matter what I say, of course, there's going to be even people out there that will agree and disagree, which create camps. Uh, all I'm saying, of course, is that this is just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with anything. This is based on a question that somebody had asked. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm trying to enforce this. As I said, it's not even of interest of mine. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not in my thoughts. It's, it doesn't mean that I'm not hearing things. Um, but, you know, those are my initial kind of responses within it. Is it responsible or is it like the best approach? Probably not, but it's the best I can do in the moment because I still want to create, you know? So, um, you know, I, I, I don't think it should stop anybody from continuing to really develop their own work and produce more things, so. And I'm sure we'll get another question, you know, about the whole AR thing later, later on tonight um, as people jump in and out, uh, you know, the curiosity of that whole topic is such a hotbed. And I think what people are looking for are validations, you know, from someone that they follow or they see online. They're saying, you know, tell us what you think so I can follow that mentality too. But um, through your own research and education, you should come to your own conclusions. Uh, but I know that people are very afraid of making the wrong choice about how they should do certain things, not because of your, your, of your own fault. Uh, we tend to kind of follow trends or interests of things and we kind of, you know, all move together. Um, so in the beginning, had I had thoughts about using the whole AI thing, I found it interesting. But then eventually I was like, eh, it's not even interesting anymore. But in the beginning, of course, as everyone's moving the same direction, how could you not be interested, right? Engaging in it somehow. But um, I never did. So Lama said, saying, you know, uh, as a professional digital artist, you feel safer than young people. I hate when AI... Uh, Art AI does, but you have to adapt to life to survive. Uh, and again, Lama Head, you're saying, you know, for people that are established, you feel safer than younger people. And that's generally what I was saying, you know, for the younger artists, uh, not being able to understand how to engage in certain things also restricts some of their choices as to where to go. Um, again, the adaptability is really the key thing. So adaptability is not even just using that technology per se. It's about being open to and receptive to many other approaches um, and to have longevity within art and design. Uh, sticking with just one company to work at is not going to be the thing. Uh, the idea is having independent control of your ideas and your creative outlets and your expressions uh, through your control of your own medium and your content, uh, which is about producing products, you know, making your own things, uh, is really the only way to, I think, maintain uh, working on a company, there seems to be a thought of job security there, but there really isn't, you know? You could be working there part-time or full-time, but again, based on either contract or full-time contracts, they can drop you, you know? Uh, project is you know, out of money, or they don't have any more work, or they overexpended, you know, their, their funding. Things can happen. 
So, you know, I haven't been stayed in the studio no longer than three and a half years. That's as long as I stayed in the game studio. And th this idea and concept of staying at a game studio where animation plays for like 20 plus years, today in this day and age, I don't know, I don't think really that's really the way to go about it. So uh, if you want to really last in the industry, again, like I said, having strength within your own independent control of your creative ideas uh, is something you should consider doing. So, you know, whether it's going to things like licensing and producing, you know, um, books and comics and prints and stuff like that uh, and, and kind of trying to do it the legitimate way if you can um but yeah being this independent person and artist is really is as shogun is saying um the wave of things you know and this is the day and age in which the idea of moving more independently is easier than it was 20 years ago you know yeah their job security is definitely not a thing it never really was it, it was just an illusion you know I'm going to put another piece in here. Because I certainly didn't have job security. <laughs> and I've had full-time jobs for over seven years in the gaming industry. And even if I was you know, hired full-time, I've been laid off several times. Company doesn't run very well. Project money gets out of money. There's no more work. I'm drawing this weird like dragon demon bird thingy right now. It started from over here on this side, kind of rotating it in this direction. I, don't know, I might put something in the center here. Maybe some kind of like worm or grub. Lama is also saying it's very hard to predict what to do now. Uh, I have young kids who like art, and I don't even know if I should encourage it as a potential field anymore. Um, I, I, I mean, I, obviously they're your kids, so you know I'm not going to tell you how you should raise your own children and stuff like that. You do what you feel is responsible and best for your, um, you know, children. Uh, for me personally, having been a teacher for over twelve years, uh, the idea of encouraging creativity is more important than the idea of trying to find a job in the beginning, especially at a very young age. Uh, but putting that much pressure on the idea of an industry of career, uh, uh, obvious, I'm sure you know this, I don't think it's the best approach to put that in the mind just yet. Uh, to be able to just create because it's something they just enjoy doing and staying in that kind of momentum. And then of course, playing with the different mediums to find the different avenues in which that can be applied to, whether it's drawing or painting or sculpture or photography or film or acting or whatever the case is. Um, so, you know, I certainly would say that the idea of creative freedom is really the topic of interest, not so much about the fear of what certain industries or careers that won't flourish, it, it, you know, not knowing if they're going to be able to work in the industry, shouldn't be the, the dictating control as to why they shouldn't explore that side. Um, I understand, you know, at the end of the day, you still want them to be successful and make money and whatnot and have a career in things. Uh, but, you know, I think most people usually can adapt and, and find ways of making it something that can... Uh, be something that for the future of a career or survive on. Uh, not all the times, of course, but. Sorry, my, you know, my mouse were fast. Then is asking, what can we do as young multi hyphenists to get to the solar entrepreneur kind of idea stage? Uh, also, hope you're doing well. Thank you. Appreciate that. You chatted with me at Decon. Awesome. And we chatted about this topic. Um, but, you know, what can you do as young artists who have, um, you know, potentially multi hyphenated or, or positioned uh, statuses of where you can go within the industry itself? And how can you become someone more independent? And, you know, that's the troubling thing, of course, is that it's, there's no one path. And these kind of things, unfortunately, have to be discovered on your own by actually walking that path, right? And there's no guarantee within it that you'll succeed. And no matter what I say, it doesn't necessarily give you any sort of uh, proper way of approach because I am not in your position. I haven't started as young students who are today. So, and then you could say, well, what, couldn't you give me advice based on what you went through? to assist on what's going on now for younger people. It's like, not really, because 
what it was 20 years ago is nowhere near now what people today face. Now, if you know, that's within the idea of industry focus and trying to become solo artists or independent artists. Yes, there are some things that overlap and there are many things that are kind of uniform and parallel based on just being an artist. That's within the typical obvious things of training and, and fundamentals and education and how you communicate and network. And, you know, those are typical things we have to kind of go through. But in terms of the engagement towards how do I become A to B within a student and an independent artist and be successful, it's like that path is, is a mystery. You know, so what I did to get there, of course, was work in a corporate situation. Go from, from corporate, I went to freelance. From freelance, I went to education. But that path was uniquely my, uniquely my own. Uh, so being uniquely my own thing doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So if you went through the corporate route and the education route, is that going to be the same result for you? I, I don't think so. But the thing is, it also took me, you know, almost 20 years to get there. Um, where hopefully with some of you, it'll get there in half the time or less, right? So, you know, that question I understand of looking for some form of advice as to where to go next. But really, the only key advice is to enjoy in the present as to what you're creating and doing. Uh, and hopefully adapt in those situations where given an opportunity, you act on them through confidence. And all, through that use of confidence and decision making, hopefully the fruition of something happening will come from it. What that is, I have no idea. But I do hope for the best for you, you know. So you have to just learn by doing. And in most situations, of course, things will not really succeed as way you would like to. But that shouldn't stop you from trying, right? That's why we all do the risk of trying to follow a passion of something. There is a, a chance for it to be successful. Uh, Beckles is asking, uh, you mentioned in the previous video, you use, I use a marker and pen to conquer fear and navigate a blank page. Could you explain this process? So, um, Within my classes of dynamic sketching, for those of you that have not really understood the process of that class, what I teach, it is about being able to instruct on how to view the world, not really about even drawing. You can literally just copy stuff out of a photograph and follow methods out of a book, and you can get better at drawing, okay? Uh, and you spend like 10 years on it, you will get better. What I'm trying to really teach is how you see the very things that we're trying to draw in a way that we're able to build certain elements. Uh, key things within a list. Goals of confidence, visual vocabulary, uh, mileage, right? Muscle memory control. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the ability to visualize. All those things are obviously connected together. From the me uh, muscle memory to the visual library to the visualization of form. Um, and with those key elements within place, gives you the tools to go out there and also adapt them to different sort of classes and techniques and give you the an ability to be able to actually apply them into the work situations, right? Um, confidence boosting is really a big component to it. Now, in the class, as you're exploring these ideas, uh, we're using tools to put us in ch situations and challenges that engage that potential side of failure. Failure is obviously an important factor on being able to present those ideas and to learn from, right? So what better way to learn and fail with, with a drawing technique than to use a tool that is gonna almost sometimes guarantee that in the, in the beginning. So we primarily use pens, felt-tip pens within sketching and drawing for dynamic sketching uh, because it is there as a tool to present to you every mistake you would make from the decision-making you have to make to the lines you put down to the interpretation of shape and form. Uh, and all those things have to culminate as a visual information as it communicates onto the page. Uh, does, it show, does it show your aptitude on being able to actually capture those things? Again, most times people don't do it very well. It's very difficult uh, to act on, very easy for me to say. We're just looking for simple shapes and forms, but that's very hard to do. And then we also then diversify all the kinds of different subject matters, animals and mechanical things and props and you know large and small. So based on the fact that it's supposed to be very difficult using a tool with a pen, having a blank piece of paper and using a permanent tool like a pen to go onto the page creates a lot of hesitancy and fear at first. You have to overcome them. Yes, failure is a key thing, but I also want to be able to transition into a side of comfort and conf confidence as we have some bridges you know, we can connect. So then the use of a marker, uh, which I had one earlier, somewhere over there. And we would use, oh, actually I have some here. These markers are the Ola marker. Uh, the Ola markers are a brand uh, based in the U.S., Japanese made. It's a good, good marker. 
Uh, this is a 30% cool CG3. And this cool grain marker I can use to basically draw with, right? So these markers I don't use as a value tool because it could be used one of two ways. One, a marker could be used to control value systems, light to dark, right? So you can fill them in with shadows and whatnot. Uh, it's a great rendering tool set for that. A lot of transportation designers use markers for sure, analog logs, mostly digital today, but you know, markers back then. Um, but the way we use it in our class is not to use it for value, but we use it for construction. We build the things that we draw from observation, let's say like animals or whatever the case is, through shape and form and line uh, with a marker initially, light value, and then from there line the work on top of the pen, reconstructing everything from the shapes and the lines of all the information underneath to build even more confidence with the tool. So as we then have the marker and we keep doing that process of repetition, we take the marker away eventually because we don't, we don't, we don't want to become dependent on this and we go straight to the pen. You're still going to make a lot of mistakes. Within my sketches and drawings daily that I do, I still make a lot of mistakes within line, proportion, shape, whatever the case is. But there's confidence. Confidence that I know that I can actually make it better, right? So even if it doesn't turn out visually the best, I know that I can problem solve in some other way through mileage. Uh, so that's really the key way of how we use mark markers in the class, uh, giving ourselves an opportunity to kind of bridge the distance of something that's really scary to kind of cross and traverse over into the ideas of the visual that we have to capture, right? I hope that makes sense. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to some of the other questions here. <clears throat> Bob is asking, are you planning to make another instruction booklet like the Dynamic Bible? Uh, yes, volume two will be out for next year, summertime. Uh, Stark is asking, uh, could you teach the, about the block-in technique, either in a separate video or a book that you can recommend. Uh, you're unaware of this technique and I heard it is essential. So the block-in technique, which is basically like, you know, the underlay, right? Or, or the uh, construction of shapes and forms I just kind of mentioned and talked about. So then, of course, you know, the things that I discuss in my own classes uh, and also the books that I have within the Dynamic Bible and many other books that are out there for construction and sketching techniques uh, would apply that. Perspective is not a block-in technique. Perspective is the... the you know, use of a tool to create the illusion of depth. That's all that tool is. So it's not a block-in technique. Um, to be able to block things in, you have to understand what it is you're even trying to interpret as a shape and a form to represent the thing you're trying to draw. So if I draw a human being, blocking in the human shape proportion, I need to be able to understand, you know, those elements that are there two-dimensional and it's a three-dimensional form. So let's draw the other head on this side now. Same kind of like bird thing. I'm just practicing the idea of just turning things in space a little bit here. I'll get back to some of the questions here in just a moment. Hopefully you guys can hear me okay. <clears throat> Uh, the pen I'm using right now is also called the Magic Pen. It's a Japanese tool. I don't know where it came from, but I bought it at a, at a Japanese um, stationery store. I, in terms of, I don't know exactly where it came from as a brand. So, Gabe is mentioning, you notice that your side profile has more line comparison to the others with that conscious choice. Well, it's because I haven't really worked back into these yet. I've only lined the base, silhouette, and internal information. This one has a lot of dark accent, so line weight information. Uh, shadow shapes and whatnot, which I haven't done so here, which I could do so later on. Angie is saying, you feel like there's a weird leap between beginner and intermediate artists. What are the things um, we need to keep in mind to support continued learning and improvement to reach an intermediate level? Uh, so let's establish what our the qualifications of a beginner to then an intermediate. The beginner, of course, having no, let's say, technique or pre-programmed uh, information about the ways of approaching art and design, right? So someone who is obviously uh, lacking any sort of fundamental base things. So as a beginner, and it doesn't matter what age you are at that point, we're not saying that you're someone who's very young or someone who's very old because some people can start later in life. All of us start at zero, right? So as a beginner, um, you are trying to understand the concepts and the methods of how to actually capture the visual thing. 
So for me, as a beginner at a young age, because I started drawing at the age of five, all right? So you could say that I was a beginner then, as we all are. Um, and then I progressed my way through up into high school and the college years and whatnot. Um, where, so then what is the intermediate level? I would say the intermediate level is having a relative strong concept and confidence in the tool sets of those fundamentals and being able to apply them. Apply them into certain mediums or apply them into certain type of products that you're also trying to work towards within the industry. Okay, um, When you become advanced level, that's where you're trying to prove. Prove that your work has the competitive standards that is out there in the industry at the junior level. Okay, So intermediate is having a relative strong control in the concepts of the fundamentals within and being able to begin to apply them within creations of things. Um, but it's at the early stages of the creation, right? So I guess going back to the question, you know, how do we um, support, keep in mind and support uh, the continued learning for the improvements to then reach that level of intermediate? I think one of the key things, and I mentioned this a lot, and I already mentioned it a little bit here today, uh, is the idea of having strong connections. Because you can hammer away at that fundamental and continue to become really good in controlling those tool sets, but it's one-sided, meaning the one-sided aspect is that it's siding on you. You being able to pursue that skill, being able to pursue that technique, and to focus on certain focuses within to apply into those mediums. Now, you can be very you know, critical and aware and, and um, you know, uh, sharp-minded on how you can be you know, kind of like, analytical about your methods and things that stand out and things you like about things. But a lot of us can very much miss stuff. We can also feel very much self-doubt. We can also feel very much lost in the directions of things that we're trying to go towards, whether in technical or towards industry. So people is, I think, another important step within those in-between stages to find the right environment, to find the right group of people to work towards, to get to the intermediate stage. Uh, in the beginning, you may not really know somebody you know, maybe they, there wasn't a surrounding of individuals that drew with you, sketched with you, showed you things. Now, there's some that do. You know, I started off at a young age where my family, my grandfather showed me how to draw and sketch. Uh, didn't really instruct. He would just draw. I would just watch. Uh, but then at a very young age, I had uncles um, and whatnot that were also interested in the world of art. They never really pursued it because, you know, they immigrated from Korea back in the 70s and 80s. So they never really pursued their own passions. They just had to work. But they still had a notion of it. So they very much encouraged me. And so even that early beginnings of the family was a part of it. Then at my, at my young age, you know, I started finding other friends that were into things like the hobbies of stuff that I liked, like comics and whatnot, and animation. So we would talk about those things and we would sketch and draw, but I didn't really find that art community until I was about 15, 16, my high school years. And once I found that, that's when I really started to like grow. Um, because, you know, on my own as a beginner, I was just playing. But then as I found people, friends who drew and sketched with me, then we started to think about like, hey, we should make stuff. Like, let's make a comic or let's design this character, make up stories. So then it's an early part of training of being able to think about their stages of actually taking this a bit more seriously. So then once I went to college, you know, from that beginning stage, I started being introduced to more intermediate level of application of that beginning stage of fundamental work. So having the right people is really a key on the steps to maintain a proper direction uh, of motivation, enthusiasm, encouragement, confidence, and enjoyment of the field that we work in, you know? So again, like I said, just because you have all those skills being one-sided, the problem with that is there is always somebody better, okay? There are people, thousands of people out there that are far better than me, drawing-wise, developing concepts and ideas and designs, but regardless of that, I'm still confident in what I can do, and I still very much enjoy what I do. And I can do it at a level that can compete, but I'm certainly not the best, but I like seeing that. I like knowing that because it encouraged me also to continue to you know, strive for that next level. Um, and that's the way it should go, right? Angie, I hope that made sense. Another question here is, any advice for someone who is stuck in a creative block? Well, um, it's not so easy to, to act on what I'm saying right now, but here you are, right? You're asking me this question. I have an artist's block. How do I overcome it? 
well, of course, I can ask you a bunch of questions, and you can you know respond to them if you want to, and even things like, well, what are you doing to get past them, and do you have the right community, and do you have the right tools, and you have the right techniques, you have all these things. Regardless of that, what are you doing right now, right? Well, right now, you are watching me, and you're maybe just watching, but could you also be doing something else? Could you be also trying to create with me? Could you be trying to sketch with me? And you're like, well, I don't know what to sketch. And it's like, that's fine. You can sketch what I'm sketching. I'm drawing a bunch of bird heads. And they're like weird mechanical creature things. I don't know. Could you do your own interpretation of that? Well, you think, well, I don't really have interest in that kind of stuff. That's fine. But here you are watching me still. And you have maybe a moment, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. Could you sketch something? Maybe it fails. Well, I don't know if I was going to be very good. What does that matter, right? You're just here just playing. So could you do something now to overcome this? Because you can think about plans and techniques and methods and all this different approach in the future to overcome this artist block, but that may never happen. You can plan all you want. The best way to do something is to start now, right now. So if you are willing to sketch with me, maybe that will help you kind of find an avenue or a click that makes you overcome this sooner than later. It's not guaranteed, but I'm just saying, hey, here's a suggestion. If you're thinking, well, I don't know what to draw, well, I'll tell you what to draw. Let's draw some birds and look for some references of birds, right? Maybe you like them, maybe you don't. You'll find out. Let's keep this going a little bit. I'm going to finish up this guy real fast. This pen's starting to dry out. That's all right. I'd rather kill it and then we'll move on to a different pen. A <clears throat> uh, couple questions I missed. Stark is asking, have I seen the Pinocchio move from Guillermo del Toro? I have. Fantastic. And I love del Toro's work. Uh, it'd be fantastic to work with him one day. Uh, let's see. Lama is asking, do you feel like if you used a pencil, you can be more gesture and free with your style uh, than with a pen where it would leave permanent marks? Or is that what the markers are for? Regardless of pencil, pen, or marker, I draw with them equally the same because it comes through with the muscle memory and the method of process. Um, the, if the medium is controlling how you're reacting to things, it's because you haven't put enough time into them just yet, but also you haven't found the method that really helps you, you know, develop ideas visually through sketching, which it can migrate to whatever tool you're using. So if you have to find a way to change your thought on how you use a medium, now granted there are certain things you can take advantage of and things to be mindful of too as well, where a pen may not be as um, soft as certain pens, so you can't necessarily build you know, the, the work as through light marks and whatnot. But you know, those are small nuance of things. Generally, in terms of the primary actions of movement of, that, uh, of also muscle memory, can transfer one to the other. So I don't necessarily um, you know, worry so much about that. ASM is asking, uh, you come to revisit my fundamentals or relearn art in hopes of becoming a professional. What does one do to navigate the vast amounts of resources and paths to mastery of art? Any advice on that? Uh, so, you know, the question sounds so overwhelming, doesn't it? It sounds like, how do I learn, you know, um, like the truth of something <laughs> in a way? Uh, it, it sounds so heavy, you know, as it, as it kind of is seen that way. Um, I hope it doesn't feel that way for you, and I hope you don't really continue to really have that kind of... I'm not saying that's the way it is for you in terms of how you're thinking in a sense, but I understand that, that you know, it can feel very much, you know, quite the vast amount of things to consume. Um, but, you know, in terms of the whole navigation aspect of things, and there's so many things I could say. You have to understand, the, or I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit because I'm trying to be mindful of how much I want to converse because I could spend like an hour talking about this, you know, about you know what to do in terms of your approach. And that is in every aspect of what we talked about already slightly within things like education and people and tool sets and whatnot. Um, but if it was any sort of advice that's kind of more direct and just kind of encapsulated a little bit uh, within this idea of navigating through all these things, um, and I could just kind of turn back to the idea of just turning to people again. But that's, I don't want to just repeat the same thing I just kind of done before. And I don't want to even cop out by saying like, oh, just have fun, you know, you'll be, you'll be get better, which is important, you know, having enjoyment and fun within the medium that you're kind of creating with, 
are a factor in being able to um, sustain a, a strong drive to what you're going for. Uh, but what else is something I can say? I'm kind of thinking right now. I kind of want to talk about the idea of fortitude, you know, this fortitude and drive that there is all this stuff in front of you and the path you can take have so many potential infinite possibilities. I can take this class or go to independent route. I can go to university. I can talk to these people. I can look at this book. Uh, there, there's all this information out there. Um, regardless of that, you know, regardless of it, because just making a choice and moving is important, right? Having the fortitude just to say, let's just try and see what happens. Because again, I don't know who you are and your background and things you're going through, but if there's any sense of hesitancy or concern of the risk and concern of not being able to make it, it has to be somehow relinquished and you have to build up the sense of, again, perseverance and fortitude to go after regardless of any sort of back thinking of the self-doubt, the concern, the risk, the potential failure, and you know the length of time that it takes to get there, and then also the overwhelming amount of information, regardless of all that weight in front of you, that you're willing to take it on, you know, because there are those that will see that and say, eh, I don't know if I want to even touch the pool of this, you know, let alone jump into it. Um, it's going to take a bit of a gutsy approach. It's very easy to say, of course, right? I just want to become an artist. I want to become a professional artist, as you are saying right now. But is there something else that we can do to help, you know, strengthen that side of the fortitude of things? That no matter how much it continues to beat me down and as difficult and as much of a struggle it is, that you always keep coming back for more, right? Uh, you always get up and stand up. What makes someone do that, right? Is it learned? Is it inherent? Uh, is it inherited? You know, um, and I think and I think about these things every now and again because for myself, I've always had the ability to stand up and finish, regardless if I do it well or not. And I've been knocked down many times, physically and within the careers of focus I'm gonna do. Um, so I, I understand it's you know a hard thing to even consider a thought of like, well, how do I even engage in this thing? Uh, I understand that having a good kind of like environment as we mentioned you know the right people around you is probably the part in which it stills this to a degree um, but i also do think it can be very much nurtured and also grown by yourself um, but it, you know you have to have, a bit, have, have to have a bit of a, a dog-like mentality right <laughs> where you kind of chase it and you want to just go after it um, whenever you find yourselves in the moments of like wanting to give up not really sure where it's going to go not really finding the inspiration feeling an artist's block that you're willing to just bite down and go for it. I'm not saying that you should like hurt yourself, of course, right? In terms of just overworking, burning out, that kind of thing. Balance is important too. Those are obvious given aspects. But at the same time, given the grit to go, right? It's such a, I know, a very kind of like abstract way of explaining this because there's no real defined way of advice of telling you you should do this and this and this to get there. But I converse about this as a subject have you have the thought behind well how does it feel for you you know do you feel like you have that sense of like wanting to go for it if you have that to a degree even a remote feeling of it then i think you're in the right spot you know that you you can use that to some degree to build more stoke it and to then use and engage to whatever then pathway you're going to try to follow because whether you fail at it you'll fall and then you move into something else that you'll keep going right but i do hope that along that way you do find the right people. You have the right encouragement. You do have the family that and friends to support you. And also then, you know, the other things of education and all techniques and tools that you need to have. Financial support as well, too. Not everybody has that, but I do hope you do get it, okay? Sorry, that probably felt like a big waste of time of question answer. <laughs> Beckles is asking, you decided to buy a set of transparent 3D shapes to support construction. 3D forms uh, in drawing. You want to rotate forms and draw them accordingly. Do you think that this should be a hindrance or a benefit? Benefit. That sounds awesome. That's what I would recommend for a lot of people to do. Looking at actual physical observational things, I think it's very, very smart. So, Beck, well, I think that was a great idea. You just share where you got those things. 
Spice King is saying, you just finished your last semester at school and now that I have time with personal art, I want to get better with drawing, with ink. Do you have any tips or suggestions? Um, well, there's two parts to that that I can kind of quickly mention. Let's first mention, uh, you know, in terms of getting drawing, you know, better, better with ink, essentially, on your own time. Well, of course, you know, any advice could be about just engaging in it. Just use it. Because I don't care if I can show you the techniques of using it like this and this and this and this. It doesn't matter because your hand is not my hand. Your way of seeing things is not way of seeing, my way of seeing things. Sorry. Not long. So anything I say within that doesn't necessarily really help you. Uh, it can give you some thoughts. And this is why, of course, taking a class is really beneficial. But on your own time, you are on your own, right? So in that sense, any advice I can give is to engage in it. The more you engage, the more familiar you get to the medium. So if you feel like you're just kind of testing it here and go and that kind of stuff and playing with it as more of a, a sense of just kind of like seeing what can happen, you're going to get limited data. But give yourself enough time and really just kind of get into the mileage of producing as many as possible within obviously a balanced time uh, should hopefully then reinforce how you should really use ink in the situation. So then, of course, taking a class really helps. Um, but if it doesn't happen to be that case, then, of course, hopefully you can build some kind of scheduling and discipline of a daily kind of activity and you engage in the ink drawing. So that could be things like copies, uh, actual master copies of other artists' work, uh, playing with the different mediums that those artists use. From there, actually finding different techniques online through tutorials of books or videos or whatever the case is, showing exercises and whatnot. And then from there, you know, going into maybe some actual lessons within classes. Uh, if anything like that is available, I would engage in, right? The other part that I wanted to respond to uh, from Spice King's question was that one thing he just mentioned. You just finished your last semester at school, and now you have personal time for your own art. That tells me a lot already, you know, because um, I'm not saying what Spice King is doing is wrong. That's pretty normal for a lot of people saying that, well, you know, I'm in school training this thing, or I have a job, part time or full time. I got a family. Those are your priorities. So, of course, you have to engage in them and finish them the way you have to. Have, the way you have to. But the fact of the matter is that even while you were doing that, you weren't allowing yourself to have personal art time at all. Maybe not. You know, maybe you didn't do those things. But maybe not as much as you were trying to do now. Seeing that now I'm free, I'm on vacation, I can do personal art. What happens if you don't? Will you do it on your time when you're back in school? And if you, you know, do while you're off, when then you go back into semester, will you draw again? Well, it's like I'm busy now. I can't draw in personal stuff. So what happens in the months that you're actually off, building on your skill and technique, and then moving into another kind of like thing, transition of like working again, and you drop all that stuff. You lose it, skill base wise. So then when you're now off on break again, and oh, I have personal art time again. What happens? You got to start over because you feel like you've lost in all that skill and technique and, and you feel rusty. There's a constant cycle that's really vicious. So the more important thing is not what you should do with your personal time right now. You think about this long-term effect, effect of if you go back to school, you're in session a semester, I know you're busy, but can you find some time daily, every other day, a couple times a week, even just for yourself to sketch what you want to sketch, right? And if you can't, then it's going to affect your ability to continue, in my opinion. So think of it that way, more big picture, less of this kind of like in the moment, situation, you know? Everybody has busy lives, you know? We all have things we gotta do. And you can't avoid them. That is life. But if you can't now find some way to balance it where you are also given the moments of time to be able to engage in the things you enjoy doing. You never really will. Prayag from Art Studio saying, you know, how, you know, from India, how to improve line quality. Uh, well, I think a lot of times with line quality is to look at the line quality of other artists, right? Trying to match up to them. This is why we did so many master copies back then. If you're a beginner, the master copy is so important trying to actually not just only imitate to just do what they do, to be able to imitate or copy to understand, right? 
to re-engineer things backwards, to engage it, but also incorporate it, the things that we learn from other things that we have. So that's a, you know, a method that all artists usually do. All right, let's get this one done. This piece here. This pen's a little bit dry right now, which is why it feels more textured than the first one. That was more fresh ink. That's okay. Uh, once I go back into these, adding some kind of darks and whatnot, accents, this will match up. Some kind of weird, abstracted, surreal imagery of bird heads that are wired up with mechanical things. As Tarada's work can also feel surreal at times as well. Of course, pulling a lot of inspiration from Mobius as well, too. Speaking of which, Mobius. This is Mobius right here on my chest. The Silver Surfer, Mobius's work. Yeah, and uh, you know, congrats on graduating after this semester. Hopefully, you'll finish through well and strong. Good luck with it. Okay, I wanted to put something in the center, uh, some kind of weird grub-like thing. I'm going to zoom in a bit more into this specific area. Sorry. <clears throat> Let's put it right there. I don't know, some kind of weird uh, worm, grub, mechanical thing again. Hey Jason, how's it going? Yeah, breaks has only just started. Uh, I finished up my classes in person on Saturday. Um, I had I have still have some meetings I got to do for some students, mentorship wise, which I haven't gotten back to just yet. I got to do that real soon. Uh, so some work still left over, and uh, I still have some actual work I got to do. <laughs> so uh, it never really ends. Uh, I got to do some packaging design. I got to do some illustration work for some clients. So uh, I actually have job job stuff I got to do. And you also add to that, I'm looking to try to make some of your own. Uh, I'd like to, to get an example of a well-made book to see how they are put together. What books in that style do you recommend? Accordion books? Well, the one that I'm using currently is made by the company uh, Etcher. So again, this is the company name, Etcher. You can find them online. I'm gonna give this weird worm mechanical thing grub leg structures in this segmented piece with wires and gears and weird things attached to it. This kind of stuff is, you know, there's no purpose behind the actual subject matter. It doesn't have to even be logical. You can just play and just create and draw things. They're just kind of weird amalgamations of things. This is where you kind of let the creativity just flow and find interest of visual things and kind of piece them together and mix them together as well too. Have fun just making it up. 
So I'm taking some visual inspiration from, you know, the insect forms that I've seen and different kind of grubs and worms, especially like big beetles. Big beetle grubs are really interesting looking. Uh, ASMS asking, do I have any sort of community Discord by chance? I do have a Discord, but it's under my own classes right now, my school. And the only way to join that Discord is through my own classes, unfortunately, at the moment. I don't have a public Discord just yet. Um, I don't know if I would ever consider really opening one because my class Discord is actually busy enough. So uh, if you want to become a part of a Discord, you can always join my classes in the future. Uh, classes can be, you know, obviously registered for, or you can even go for the sit-in seats. Citizens are a fraction of the cost, but it does help you or basically give you the opportunity to engage with the many hundreds of people that are part of the Discord. So pro problems down the line say you, you wanted to look up birds and now you ended up drawing a turtle. That's great. You start from one thing and you end up into another. So now you're drawing turtles, have fun with it. Sketching turtles is fun. Draw like a crazy, weird, snapping alligator turtle, something like that. Those things are crazy looking. Uh, Vander is asking, what time is it for me right now? Uh, it is 11.20 p.m. Hoyser is asking, uh, you really want to join the online courses. Do you think this is a problem? I mean, as long as you're able to understand English well enough to process the information I'm giving, then also being able to ask a few questions through basic means, sure, absolutely. Uh, but that's based on your level of comfort, okay? And just because English is not your first language, uh, it doesn't mean you're allowed to try, obviously, to ask questions and whatnot. And I would try to interpret them as best I can. Um, but of course, you'd be welcome. Let me use my other pen real quickly. This one's practically dropping dead. Uh, this is a Tombow, the, the Furinosuke Tombow. We're gonna go in there and just kind of darken some accents here and there. Do the kind of thing we see on the, on the left-hand side with that bird head that I did previously. These kind of little dark accents are there to refine, uh, to help separate some visual information and details, uh, pushing things like line weight. Let me kind of group things together a little bit. Sebastian's, you know, asking if you're really lost in life right now, how did I find my meaning in life? Um, you know, for me, in terms of what my meaning is for why I do what I do, uh, is to help, obviously, others get to their next plateaus. Because in my experiences in life, the majority of my engagements with other people, family, instructor, and friends, have always been ones to help me get to those next plateaus for myself. And because it was such a prominent experience in how I engage in education and personal learning, I feel like I'm at a point in my life to be able to now do that in return. So teaching is obviously a big component to what I do financially to support myself. Because we all have to eat. But at the same time, I do it because I truly do enjoy teaching and engaging with people uh, to help them to understand to help them find pathways, give them advice about where their next steps could go, whether they become fully su successful or not, to give them a, an opportunity for someone to just listen to them, right? Um, so for me, you know, a way I, how, I, how I found that, obviously, was because of my own history. Now, it's not the best thing to hear, mainly because maybe that's not your history. Maybe you don't really have that kind of engagement or upbringing or connection with people, uh, educationally or not to kind of give you that kind of framework. But I do hope that in the next, down the line for yourself, uh, you can make those kind of connections. Because, you know, to find meaning, I think is more than just meaning within your own thing you pursue, but in how it affects the ones around you, right? Um, 
but you just said to none, right? Uh, hopefully you'll find it. But the, the idea behind that, of course, goes back to the idea of fortitude and perseverance. You'll keep trying because uh, what else are you going to do in life, right? Um, you can keep pursuing personal interests of things, but from that personal interest, I hope it does grow into something more, you know, more into a fruitful thing that engages with others. So keep looking, keep searching as much as you can. I don't know what age you are, um, and, and, you know, that doesn't necessarily make a big difference, but if you are younger, uh, patience, discipline will be important, and, and give yourself time to grow, and give yourself time to also play with things as an idea. If you're a little bit older, you know, at this point, you've already lived and, and had some experiences. That's a good thing because you can use that engagement to also transition into the other things you're interested in. So it's not too late for you. Uh, but at the same time, for all of us, we all have to kind of continue pursuing the things that we love to do, right? Nadeshiko's drawing a tiger. Very cool. Vans are drawing a mushroom with crab legs. That's awesome. <laughs> sounds off. That sounds really fun. Yeah, Vans are saying you want to be able to draw and sketch together. Uh, you guys can use Magma Studio. I obviously have done this in my live stream. Some of you guys who are coming together here in the chat, you guys should even communicate with each other once in a while. You just never know. You know, you, you reach out a little bit, be proactive, engage. I know it's hard to put yourself out there because you don't know who you're connecting with. You know, and it's a bit of a hesitancy there and a risk factor because, you know, you don't want to connect with the wrong person. But I think we're all here for the right intentions. We all want to be artists, right? We all want to grow. So um, what better place? Yeah, Magma, uh, Magma Studio is a um, drawing program, web-based thing. So, you know, from that, you guys can share links and stuff like this. Somebody creates it and it can host, you know, upwards of a certain number of people. I wouldn't engage like 20 people at one time because it can be, it's way too busy. Uh, you know, I would say maximum five to seven people is probably pretty good. But we're gonna, you, you guys can have like different, you know, kind of like servers going on. It's all free. So it just needs people, you know, people to connect to, people to use it. So here's a weird grub worm thing. Let's go up to one of those birds again. Just real quickly to show you how I would take that. Just go a little bit further onto one of these. I don't know if we're going to get to all the end of the full page, but at least we are able to play with a little bit here visually. Turning form, drawing some abstracted things, creatures, and animals, and mechanical stuff, just to play. Hoyt is asking, uh, would I publish the Dynamic Bible 2 next year? That's the plan. Hopefully by summertime, uh, I would like to have it announced, maybe by fall to get it fully released. It would be better if I could have it at Comic-Con show in July, but I have to get that book started soon, like now, actually. <laughs> so that's my plan for next year in January, to get the book done. And if you follow my Instagram social media, I'll be posting about it there. Yeah, uh, Ed is trying to share the link because, um, I'm sorry, Lama wouldn't. He's trying to share the link. Because I don't think the uh, chat in YouTube allows the links right now. I have to turn off the moderator on that thing. Or no, I, I shouldn't have a moderator. I think the moderator is on, on um, OBS. I gotta turn it off though. Uh, you know, to be able to share it somehow, hmm, tricky. Yeah, exactly how you would do it. Maybe you can share your guys' Instagram 
you know, Instagram profiles. You guys can follow each other there and like DM it. You could do that too, ASM. You know, Discord usernames. Some people are on Discord together. Maybe, I don't know. But I would say Instagram will be the easiest to share um, connections to. So some of you guys are trying to connect to Instagram um, and talk to each other and share the link. I don't mind it. <clears throat> yeah, Lama had, you know, on the uh, Magma Studio, it, it runs just like Photoshop. Um, I mean, I would say if anything else, for a lot of people who are trying to use it, just open it up first on, on the web-based on Google, on Chrome or whatever the case is, and just kind of open up Magma Studio and just play with it independently first. Just get familiar with like the UI, the drawing program, and you have to have drawing tools like um, Cintiqs or tablets and stuff like this. You kind of need that. Uh, if you don't have one, it's hard to engage it with a mouse, right? Um, so you definitely need a, an actual digital tool set. From there, just get, you know, an idea of how you would actually run the program a little bit, the drawing into it. It's not that much different than Photoshop, as I said. Uh, but from there, then maybe you can start to share the link to invite others. Luigi is saying, how to draw dynamic poses? Well, I would say a good place to start from is actually film, cinematics. Watching film and movies and pausing it and seeing you know, really fun like action sequences or choreography and finding the camera work within that could be a good place to begin to kind of push that figure drawing is not really going to help the most because they can pose dynamically but the camera doesn't really move as much you know so but i think uh, film studies can be really really beneficial ufc fights could be really good too actually sports are great PC is asking, I re you recall that I do archery. I love archery, yeah. Any tips for beginners or in uh, interested in trying it out? Well, of course, I would say look for some ranges nearby. Uh, there could be some public ranges near you that uh, are access accessible, you know, for anybody uh, that has uh, bows and archery. You kind of have to obviously learn some of the standard rules of how to use a range, but, um, you know, it's pretty simple. From there, I would just kind of start with a very kind of basic recurve bow. Um, I would say starting at about 20 pound, 25 pound draw is probably best at the beginner stage because you just want to study mostly the movements of action, you know, how to draw properly, finding your anchor points, um, you know, really understanding the arrow, especially like the, the weight of the arrow, the length of the arrow. Uh, you really should, you know, actually look into that a lot. YouTube is a great resource for tons of information on archery. So I would definitely turn there because that's where I turn to. And go for the standard you know, Mediterranean draw. Don't worry about the whole Asiatic bows and stuff like this, which you ought to use. But for now, just start with the standard, you know, recurves and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, depending on, you know, your strength capability, starting off from 2025 20, should be relatively good. Uh, if you're a little bit younger, you can start with a youth bow, you know, like a 15 pound bow can be also good as well too. Um, but like I said, you know, measuring the actual arrow length to your draw length is important. Um, and just start real close, you know, really close to targets. Kind of shoot, just kind of practice your motions. Never dry fire, obviously. Um, but you can just shoot at like, you know, kind of standard foam targets and stuff like that on the floor, on the ground, outside. Um, and it can, you know, help you practice your, your um, actual draw motions. Mr. BB is asking, uh, the birds feel like Tarada stuff. Yeah, it does, because I was drawing with Tarada when he was doing his presentation. Not with him officially, but I was sketching in the audience. So this was his work over here. That's Tarada. Ta -da. So he sketched in my book for me. And so I just continued on and added to his piece with the bird head, which is where this came from. So this is from Tarada's work, and this is my work now. So I started to move these birds around organically. Now we're just kind of pushing some line weight, shadow shapes. We're only going to be up for maybe another 15, 20 minutes, you guys, because it's about 11.30 my time. I have to pack tonight because I'm flying out tomorrow to go uh, back to see family. So tonight I'm going to be on for just a bit longer, and we'll be wrapping up here real soon. So any other last questions or comments or thoughts, please do share. But thank you guys again for showing up to a late night uh, stream. 
For those of you that are international, it might be kind of early morning for you. Oh, the card pulls I did? Yeah, so I actually was opening a Spectrum box. One of the nice hits was a rookie card from uh, Austin Reeves, autographed. Spectra, but this is also numbered out of 10, 7 of 10. Corners look good. I gotta clean this surface. It's a bit printed up. That was a good one. I also got a uh, Redemption. So this Redemption card is for a rookie jersey autograph. So this is an RPA. Um, of James Book Knight. I don't know what the number will be, how many they're making, but this is a redemption card. So this one is the first time I forgot one of these. So James Book Knight rookie card, jersey autograph. A couple of different autographs too, but these other ones were kind of just so-so. Uh, Cameron Thomas, this is number to 75, 3, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, number to 99, 48. Then I also hit a nice um, rookie card of Josh Kitty. This one is not numbered though, unfortunately. Dalen Sharp is numbered to 99. Rookie card out of the Nets. And I also got a rookie card of uh, Greg Brown III, who is in and out of the G League and playing with Portland. Rookie card of 49. So of course, we want the rookies, so. Let me see if I can show that comment from Vander for the Discord thing. Yeah, Austin Reeves does play pretty hard. He's young. He gets pushed around a little bit, but um, you know, he's a rookie, so I'm I'm really looking forward to this kid. He's playing on Portland right now because I follow the Blazers. So I just got this card out of a uh, Panini. This is an instant uh, out of ten. This is ten out of ten. Shade and sharp. This is a patch card. Super thick. But I can't see, wait to see what he, what he does in the future. The Blazers unfortunately lost the game tonight against uh, Oklahoma. They almost had it, but man, that was a disappointing game in terms of that finish. If anybody follows sports, the World Cup was pretty amazing. It was fun, you know. Uh, congrats to Argentina. France played amazingly. I kind of almost expected France to actually win. But Argentina is no joke and, you know, Messi's been around for a long time. So it was just a pretty amazing way to finish a World Cup with penalties. <laughs> Uh, Milk is asking, uh, do I ever plan to republish or reprint the Dynamic Bible in the UK? Been wanting to get it for a while now. It, you know, I need to talk to them about that because, you know, we have copies. There are prints, but they're only available right now in the US because of SuperaniUS.com. Uh, Liber Distri, which is a European distributor, doesn't have copies yet. And I don't know what's going on, honestly. I haven't talked to them. Maybe because of the holiday stuff, I don't know. But uh, I need to talk to the manager and find out, are they planning to actually send out copies over to Europe? Um, because we do have copies printed and they're still in stock at superaniUS.com. But um, I don't know what's, well, obviously, you know, with Kim Jong-gi passing, there are some things that are a little bit delayed in terms of communication and also just stuff with also the holidays coming up. But, you know, I, I hope that it's going to start to kind of work itself to be a bit better and smoother into the future, uh, you know, going to next year. So try to be a little bit more patient and see if it'll come around the liberty industry at some point. I'll announce it on my on my uh, Instagram, of course. Miguel's asking, what kind of materials do I use for shoes customization? For leather, I primarily use uh, Angelus leather paints, acrylics. For certain other kind of mediums like canvas or, or uh, muslin materials, I use even markers.
Tosin's asking, um, best advice to be able to draw dynamically like Scott Robertson for beginners. You've been drawing for six months, only recently started your My Dynamic Bible course um, in week three. So where are you taking that, Tosin? Uh, is it under CGMA or some other school or class? Um, hopefully the experience is good. But, you know, obviously you're making the right steps, which is taking courses. You know, you're part of the draw box thing. Uh, which is probably going to help as well too. You know, engaging within the people that are experienced and, and giving you the information and resource to help you along. Feedback would be critical. You know, without feedback, it's going to be hard to know what to fix and correct on things, and also to push even better. Um, so you know, engage with many people that are out there that are also trying to learn with you, uh, and find those resources as much as possible. You know, it might take a bit of money to kind of spend to get into those access points, but you're already doing that with taking classes. So um, CGMA, yeah. So, you know, you could take that. And of course, you know, the CGMA class, I have some opinions about, but there are other kinds of schools out there that engage in more feedback. Uh, places I would recommend are like the Concept Design Academy. You know, I run school, my, my own school as well too, online. And so those are running differently than CGMA, where I do live classes for three to four hours or more sometimes uh, with full lectures and feedback and, you know, um, questionnaires and all that kind of stuff. So um, sometimes there's more there to receive than the way CGMA has set things up over the past decade or more. This accordion book that I'm working on right now, for those of you that are joining in, uh, is almost at its stages of finishing. Uh, let me just kind of zoom out slightly. Just kind of see where we're at right now. So the way it was set up was uh, this accordion book started over here with Tarada's work. And it continues down this direction. And this over here is the last part of the page. So this is the last page of the book. So we didn't get that far just yet. I might just save that toward tomorrow. Uh, I'm just kind of working on this spread right here and getting this um, filled up with this creature thing that I started from yesterday. So I'm just looking up the camera, seeing how if it's positioned well. Uh, let's see. Question is, uh, have I ever visited Iceland? I appreciate the, the invite. <clears throat> um, I've always wanted to see Iceland, actually. I miss traveling quite a bit. Uh, it would be wonderful to see. I've only heard good things about Iceland from people that have traveled there, uh, from the sites and the environments and the place and the people. And, of course, interacting with people who have you know are, are obviously living in Iceland online has been great. Um, I'm sure it's like no other place I've been to. And, you know, I've been around quite a bit. But on the northern side, you know, uh, I've been in Denmark several times. And Denmark, you know, having probably some similar type of weathering <laughs> to a degree, slightly, I'm sure is nothing still compared to what Iceland is, is like. But, you know, Denmark was still beautiful um, on the northern side. But, yeah, that'd be great if I could stop by Iceland at one point in the future on top of the many other places I still want to go to. Yeah, I wonder how much actual like wildlife work is out there when it comes to places in Iceland. Uh, studies of things like maybe within, you know, the bird studies or certain animals within the land. Uh, that would be a big draw for us to be able to actually vis visibly see wildlife in its natural environment. Uh, something that we're always interested in doing. You know, I wanted to go to Mongolia, which is one of the big trips I really want to take soon at some point, because uh, I really want to go check out the, uh, the falconers, the eagle hunters, which I don't know is still happening right now with festivals and whatnot, uh, but they, used, they would hold out you know, a festival once a year, I believe in Uzbekistan, and they would pe invite people from Mongolia to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan coming together, and do eagle hunting festivals, you know. Um, so I've always wanted to see that. But Manu, my friend, knows a lot of people that work in falconry there. So it'd be more of a personal trip anyways, too. I wouldn't have to go to the festival itself. Um, but that's something I really wanted to see. I have plans to go to Africa next year as well. Have you ever been to Eastern Europe? Um... I was in Poland a couple times. Didn't get to go to Ukraine or Russia. 
but I met many people from there, which they're all wonderful people, especially the artists and students that I met. Um, Poland was great. You know, I did two events there, uh, festivals. This was out in um, Wutz, Poland. But, um, but yeah, many amazing people, you know, having visited those areas. For next year, I'm, I'm having thoughts of trying to find plans of going back to Austria, which has an event in school out there. Not really a school, but an event that I know well, that I built with. Uh, that started from a student of mine, and uh, that's in Graz, Austria. Another one is in a school in Paris, which I've done many workshops with. Uh, Philippines, um, not that I know just yet in terms of any schools that are out there. But Armand Serrano does that whole uh, Philippines kind of like art event, which I've done online. But, you know, I would want to be a part of some sort of event, essentially, to travel, usually. In 2020, I was supposed to go to like five different countries. Uh, I, I was supposed to go back to Rome to do a uh, class out there at a school called Idea Academy. I was supposed to go back to Denmark. I was supposed to go back to Austria and back to Paris. Uh, I was going to be going into also Africa again. So I had all these trips lined up. Um, Australia was going to be for the year afterwards because I've been to Australia and Adelaide before for a school out there. I did stuff online with them this year, but all these things in 2020 canceled out because of COVID. So for next year, I'm trying to kind of ramp back up a couple of the trips if I can. So we'll see. I will be in Asia and Japan and Taiwan early next year for spring, but that's more of a personal trip. That's not like a work trip kind of thing. Philippines would be great to see. Um, even different parts of Southeast Asia. Vietnam, I hear, is amazing. Uh, Thailand, of course. Oh, that's cool, yeah. The many birds out there in Iceland and the reindeers. That'd be beautiful to see it. I have no doubt it's beautiful out there. All I need to do is find a place in Iceland that has a... <laughs> Uh, an event or a program or a school or something that invites artists. Because if I could do a talk and then they can help me get out there, I'd be very much on board. Myanmar? I mean, yeah, again, like I said, it's like if there's a place that's willing to bring me out, uh, any part of the world, honestly, I'd be interested. And I was invited to this one school uh, in Turkey. This is like before the pandemic had hit. And it was a very kind of like, it was a poor school, you know, for like kids, uh, young kids who don't really have a lot of art programs. And they invited me to come out there. Uh, this is in the south side of, of Turkey, and I believe a little bit west. And uh, I was very interested at first, but then, you know, it got really close to when the pandemic had hit. So the talk kind of broke down. Uh, but I kind of wonder what happened to the school. But, you know, it really was kind of a, a place for kids that were kind of like, you know, being taken in, that kind of stuff, for art and stuff like this. But I thought it would be really interesting to be, be a part of that. Then, of course, I've been working with some students over in Nairobi, in Kenya, which has been really fun. A lot of great uh, artists and kids out there, for sure. A lot of hunger, a lot of interest. But of course, not a lot of opportunities for work and also education. Um, but that's why it's great to travel there, to be able to meet them once in a while. At the very least, give them a bit of feedback and have them meet some of the artists and whatnot professionally. Um, gosh, I might even have their email still, I wonder. I was talking about that school with a friend that I have in Turkey. He was a boyer. He's not a boyer. He's an arrow maker. He made arrows for me uh, this year. My bow. Oh, yeah. It was called the Cartoon Mill. I have it here. In uh, Antalya. Antalya, Turkey. I don't know if that school exists anymore. It, it wasn't re it wasn't recent actually. It was like a couple years ago they had asked, but they reached out to me again afterwards, um, and this was close to the pandemic time. But they first reached out many years ago, but it just didn't work out, timing wise and schedule wise.
then I think travel got a little bit difficult around that area. But I don't know what's going on currently. But the concept of it sounded amazing. In St. Petersburg. No, oh, cool. Well, thank you again for the uh, invite. It's unfortunate, you know, the whole situation going on right now. And hopefully people out there are, are doing the best they can, especially for the ones I met, you know, that lived in Ukraine and also in Russia and different parts around the region. Met many of the young artists out there. And, you know, when they were all together, it was just an amazing time to create and discuss things about art and design. And the thing about this, as an educator, when you travel a lot so much, like the things we're talking about now, it doesn't matter really what part of the country you come from or the world you come from. We all have the same interests and wanted to create and have the passion to just have the freedom to, you know, work in the industry of, of things that we enjoy and partake in. Um, so when you're all in that like-mindedness of, of interest in creating, which all of us can share, uh, it shows there really isn't that much difference, you know. But it's helped me a lot, you know, on my own side of education to be able to engage with people from all over because I have the insight now to understand that, you know, everybody out there has the same interest in what they want to pursue. But that also makes it very disheartening and sad about the current state of many things out there and also the whole Iranian thing, you know, um, which I've met, you know, many friends here who are Iranian. Um, so, yeah, it's tough. Appreciate it, ASM. Question here is, how, could you share how to develop the visual library from vi uh, real life observation for sketching? Well, obviously I'm drawing from birds that I've imagined, but inspired by reality in the world around me. Um, there's not any kind of specific bird, if anything, maybe close to what a crow or a raven looks like with the added horns. Um, but within the observational drawing, it stems from the ability to understand not the way it actually looks, but the way you interpret it. Interpret it based on the idea of a two-dimensional shape to convert it into a three-dimensional form. So I don't draw the reality of the observation in terms of sketching and drawing to capture the exact thing as it is. We capture the gesture, the line, and the shape, and the forms that basically represent the things that we see. But we draw with numerous iterations of mileage, right? And we try to draw them as many different angles as we can. Using the simple gestures of shape and form, we can also then imagine those forms in different angles of views. We still don't add to the details of things, but even with this most basic level of information and construction, you should be able to convey what it actually looks like, or not really what it looks like, what it is as a subject matter. So is it a bird of some type? Based on its you know, shape, form, proportion, and gesture in line, it should convey that even at a very basic minimal degree. With the added information on top, of course, it makes it more somewhat realistic to a level, but um, that is how I'm able to basically build a sense of visual vocabulary, to keep it as basic and simple as I can. But harder said than done, right? Because to interpret that information is not so literal. You don't see those forms in front of you. You have to be able to visualize them. But that's where the training comes in, right? Have I ever used an ink, titanium, and fountain pen? I have not. That's pretty cool. Yeah, if it's, you know, it gives you a nice line, it feels comfortable, it's not too heavy, uh, that's great. We're almost done here. When I come to finish up this last piece on this side, we're going to be uh, breaking away because I have to finish up tonight with packing and laundry. I'm going to get up at like 5 in the morning tomorrow, so uh, it'll be early morning for me. But like I said, for those of you that joined late, I may actually do a live stream at some point during the week. Uh, while I'm on vacation, uh, visiting family, I'll be taking my phone, I have a little stand, I'll be using that to kind of, you know, maybe do the stream with. Uh, for some more sketching and drawing, maybe even some more card breaks here and there. Uh, but potentially look forward to that. Just follow my Instagram, and you'll see stories of it pop up. It's good to hear, Vanda Panzer. It's about the idea of communicating through people around the globe. Definitely necessary. And people who don't travel, who don't get exposed to different cultures and people, are the ones that usually have those kinds of uh, influences of, you know, um, the biases of things. 
especially a lot of people here in the U.S. can fall into that kind of trap sometimes. Uh, they don't get exposed to enough of the things of the world around us. I think here in the U.S. things can become, well, not just in the U.S. only, of course. Things become a bubble anywhere, right? It's hard to break your own bubble at times in terms of where you live and where you are. Uh, last question for the CGMA course. Uh, wonder if they are full now, if I have a chance after Christmas. I don't know because I don't run the CGMA registration. Um, if I wouldn't even really, I mean, I would recommend more of my own classes coming up soon. The CGMA one, the mentorship sketching thing is fun. It's great. Uh, but I run my own classes with the registration will be coming up soon. I will announce it on my Instagram. Classes on my own uh, kind of workings online don't start till the end of January. So if you're interested in classes, with the price being the same as CGMA, uh, you'll be able to engage with me directly. So those classes should be coming up soon. Registration at the beginning of next year. Appreciate you guys all stopping by. I think we're going to wrap things up here. But here's a piece that kind of shows you. Let me back up more now see the whole section of it so this is the accordion book again we're almost done uh, this was a piece I had done for the Torada show it was Torada's work himself and then I added to it which inspired the whole series of bird heads with this weird maggot in the middle and this is the last page so once I get that last page done this whole book will be finished and complete in any case um, Thank you guys again for your time. I appreciate you guys' question. I hope anything I mentioned and talked about wasn't taken any in any way other than just as opinion and thought. Um, so use it to whatever level. You can definitely just, you know, take some parts of it and try to incorporate it into your understanding and advice. And don't even consider, you know, something doesn't really work for you. Uh, but in any case, you guys can always come back next time. I'm going to be try to be on again at some point. If I don't see you, have a good rest of the year. Uh, be safe out there, especially when it comes to the weather and other things. Uh, and of course, keep sketching, drawing, and producing, and creating. And don't be so worried about all this other stuff when it comes to tech and AI things right now. And of course, the real concerns, we had a, kind of more conversation on that. But um, keep creating, keep producing, all right? I'll see you guys next time.